Okay, cool. Um, so my name is uh, Nick Axel. We're here at Design Miami Basel, and uh, I'll be speaking with Lawrence Leck, a multimedia artist, um, for the next half hour. Um, so, Lawrence, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, so I wanted to uh, I wanted to start maybe with reference to your background in architecture. Um, you know, you a lot of your work takes it creates these urban and architectural simulations. And so I wonder, can you speak about how you see the relationship between our increasing familiarity with these simulations, right? I mean, we, you know, whether it's through video games, whether it's through movies, we're becoming much more familiar with simulated environments. How do you think that has a relationship to how we view the built environment? So, um, I mean, when I was studying architecture, I thought one, big point with it, there's always the discussion about, you know, the representation versus the real, or the relationship between the drawing and the kind of built object at the end, at the end of the process. I feel like my reading of simulation, it's just a continuation of the speculation of a design that will be built before it actually exists. Mm -hmm. So for a few years, I was kind of doing a lot of like site-specific physical installations because I guess the paradigm at the time with you know, the relationship between digital fabrication and DIY was that you know, the, the designer or group of designers was like able to create forms, you know, form finding, digital architecture, alg algorithmic design, and so on. Mm -hmm. But I felt that the, the kind of glass ceiling or the limit of that was you know, endless novelty mm -hmm. that the, that even though the form of a space might be given over to a computer program, you know, the designer or architect would basically gain like curatorial control of choice basically to choose if you want it like in this shape or that shape or relating to different things. Mm. So for me, like simulation is just a continuation of that fictional line in between the promised environment and the actual environment, which, mm. you know, through through the kind of formalization of architecture as, as a kind of a mode of production that where the drawing and the building are separate. So now, of course, with you know, si simulation, 3D rendering, mm -hmm. virtual worlds, and so on, you actually get a different sense of that trajectory. So my interest was also in thinking about architecture as this science fiction vehicle, essentially, where the structure that is promised is actually a complete fiction until it actually exists in reality, by which time it exists primarily as an image or as an icon um, rather than as much as a kind of physical space. Because again, many of the debates were about you know, digital architecture or 3D rendering being somehow fake or false, mm -hmm. wh whereas the built object was the authentic thing. But actually, I thought that, no, it's not, you know, it's not the authentic thing. Actually, what is the authentic thing is the idea of a space which doesn't necessarily need a physical construct to exist. And of course, you know, with the relation between you know, paper architecture and let's say real professional architects like that, that's always been a kind of, um, kind of uh, a line that's been quite contentious. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's interesting to, to, to think about this in relation to maybe a trajectory of your, of your recent work, right? I mean, um, this, this bonus levels project that you, that you were developing for a number of years, um, this departed from, from recreations and modifications of existing spaces, right? So it's, it's almost like returning a certain building to a, uh, something that is real to a drawing. Um, but then in, in your recent work in Notel, at least, um, this is uh, one of the, the few, at least as far as I'm aware, um, of spaces that you have kind of created yourself. So I wonder, can, can you also speak to the way that you engage with, um, with maybe like pre-existing architectures, the, these, these built objects that do exist, and also what that's meant when you have maybe left the, the world of reference behind and, and gone more to a space of, you know, perhaps more radical imagination? I don't know. Sure, so I mean, briefly, I went from kind of doing physical site-specific things to virtual site-specific things, and then eventually creating like architecture that exists in a, in a virtual realm, but still references, um, you know, notions of like gravity, form and structure as well. Um, I think the, 
you know, the limitation of the virtual world, because if it's a simulation with, of, of Cartesian space with, you know, up, down, left, and right, and the kind of vertical axis, um, you're still limited by your, you know, kind of bodily frame of reference, you know, your two eyes that have a certain, you know, like nearly 90, 90 degree point of view and so on. So because visual culture as well has developed so much, not just in terms of you know, Hollywood films and visions of the future, but as well as like, you know, the visual literacy of video games and simulation, is, which is something I grew up with. Again, talking about this idea of authenticity, I always had a problem with the idea, A, that, you know, architecture is a physical building. Um, and secondly, with the idea that somehow, you know, the, the paper space or the psychological space is, is, is somehow secondary to, um, to a, a kind of physical artifact. Mm -hmm. um, so bonus levels was a way to kind of draw upon the like language of video games to really extend and play with the, the boundaries of where these, you know, the simulation of the existing or the reframing of the existing kind of contrasts with like my own imagination of what a building might be. So for example, in you know, series like Assassin's Creed, you often have two different time frames, one kind of present day and one in the past. So for example, if there's like the pyramids, you would kind of go back into like Pharaoh times and then back into the, and then fast forward into kind of present day. Or you'd recreate like, um, you know, 19th century Paris and then you would walk between that and the, sorry, medieval Paris between that and, you know, the Second World War. So the historical reenactment side is like a very well mined thing in kind of commercial video games because people can reference like a specific time and place. And it's the same with in TV with, you know, costume period dramas. Somehow, for some reason, in the popular imagination, there's something quite compelling about reliving the past mm -hmm. through the safety of not having the risks of, you know, war, pestilence, famine, and, and, and all of those things. You know, games give you this safe space to experiment within. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like, again, virtual worlds and, and, and simulations gave me the space to kind of experiment with design. And when, while I was initially, like, hesitant to create spaces out of nothing, which again was my criticism about arch um, algorithmic architecture. Mm. Um, increasingly, I've been making more and more fictional spaces that are still site-specific or context-specific. So, for example, my film Geomancer is set in Marina Bay in Singapore, but also in this inverted version of it, not inverted, but kind of like twisted version of it, where it's the same physical structure, but the mood and times have, have changed because, you know, of global warming, of the rise of like automation and AI, that has also caused social changes. Even though the buildings might look the same, the times are different. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder, like when, when, we, when we engage with kind of existing reference, um, you know, like a building like the Tate Modern or, or you know, like the Louvre, right? There, there's a certain um, social imaginary that already exists around that. And so it, it kind of create, it puts you as an artist or as a creator in a different role with regards to the type of narrative that you want to create. But then when you're creating kind of your own context, and maybe this is, um, this, this is evident in things like Geomancer or you know, your, your more extensive film projects where you really have to kind of create a narrative framework to understand what this world is. Sure, and I think like, <clears throat> again, those, those paradigms of like architectural design as a cinematic space as you see in you know, kind of early works of like Bernard Schumi, for example, or um, you know Dylan Scafidio, which is playing with kind of like tropes of cinema visuality or cinematographic visuality, and applying them somehow, adapting them to architectural design of a space. Um, still, with at least with Shumi and Dylan Scafidio, it was really about either you know surveillance or this idea of like montage of this idea of storyboarding, which is you know very, in my opinion, quite. Old, old fashioned filmmaking in a way, you know, this idea that filmmaking is a very um, analog process where montage creates illusion of continuity, whereas obviously in an architectural space, you can't teleport from one location to another. And so again, with the open world video game, I was really interested when I actually found out much more about, you know, the process of simulating an open world, because of course, you know, computational power is not 
unlimited. There are ways of creating tricks where, as a player or witness to the scene, you feel that you're free, but you're totally constrained. So, for example, that's the reason in many games now it's a bit different. But you know, you would go through corridors and valleys, for example, because corridors and valleys are a way to. It's kind of like this um, computational enfilade space, right? So, while that world is unloading before that world loads, the corridor or valley gives mm -hmm. the computer time to load up those two things, yeah. you know, which even though it's milliseconds or, you know, in CD-ROM kind of times, it would take like 30 seconds to load a new level. But now the expectation is seamless real time, mm -hmm. not breaking that, not fourth wall, but somehow not pausing this idea that it's perpetually in real time. It's no longer 30 frames a second, it's 60 frames a second, or 90 frames in VR. So always the kind of boundary between the speed of the simulation, the refresh rate, essentially, of the simulation, or the, um, is, and you know, this is said about you know, HD images and you know, Super HD 4K and so on, but in terms of like, the speed of refresh, mm -hmm. it becomes more and more hyper-real in a, in a kind of different sense. Yeah. And I feel that's, Fascinating, because you know you look at a a game that's five years old and it's dated in a very strange way, and, and in a similar way to you know like you might see black and white film or the you know silent movies yeah. when with the advent of color. Um, but I think how this relates to architecture again is that again, you know the kind of architectural purists who think that you know the real tactile environment, the phenomenological world of you know, of our five kind of bodily senses can never be exceeded. For me personally, because I've had to experiment and engage with the relatively cutting edge technologies, I see that those, those things like, you know, real time ray tracing and things like that with um, which, you know, calculate real time light bounces in a, in a f simulated physical way. It's not cheating anymore, it's actually simulating mm. physics as opposed to cheating it through kind of texture or through tricks. So as basically what I'm saying is as computation becomes more physically mo modeled on physical space or physical light or you know, physical sound, um, it's a kind of fascinating thing that, that happens with my own engagement with real architectural space. Basically, I see everything, I don't see, there's a generalization, but I, I see how everything existed as a rendering yeah. before now. I mean, like this Herzog and de Moron, kind of refurbishment of this Art Basel kind of complex as well, yeah. you know? Yeah, but I think you, I mean, to go back to this, this, this statement, which I think is really important that you made, that this is not necessarily like a new phenomena, right? Like Piranesi was doing this, yeah. right? I mean, this, this idea of paper architecture, but, and so you can, I mean, there has been this story where like, you know, you can see if a building is built in Rhino or in, in Archicad. You can read the goes. program, right? Exactly. Used to, used to build it. Just like before you could read maybe the training, like mm -hmm. a, a designer had, what school they were from, yeah. Beaux-Arts or Beaux -Arts. Chinese or whatever, you know, whatever, yeah. what kind of, what kind of um, aesthetic signifiers they were dealing with, you know, mm -hmm. to what level of like decorated shed they were trying to, you know, participate in. Yeah. Um, but going back to just briefly what you were asking about, um, yeah, the limitations of m my own process with creating buildings because just like, I mean, going back to the decorated shed and, you know, the, the duck kind of thing, I'm actually much more interested in designing buildings that are symbolic and really say what they are. So, for example, um, a project at Bold Tendencies in London I just finished is called FTSE Farsight Stock Exchange, which is this fintech incub fictional fintech incubator skyscraper in the shape of a pound sign over an existing car park that's this um, kind of public art space. Yeah. And sometimes I feel that because I'm dealing with quite often quite satirical things, being super literal about what I'm playing with is quite appropriate. Yeah. And yeah. But I mean, so oftentimes the buildings that you use are highly iconic. Right, I mean, they have very clearly defined forms, and that's assuming that they're not already pre-existing icons. But so, you know, it's it's, and maybe here we're kind of come back to this question, like, what has been the effect of this more like, you know, digital mindset on our understanding of of the built environment? But what 
do you see as like the role of, of architecture? It's a very kind of broad question, but right, I mean, you're saying that you are kind of drawn towards, you know, uh, almost like symbolism or iconography. Yeah. Um, I mean, does that also kind of exist just in these simulated environments? Or like, is that also, um, is that also a statement on, on the cities that, you know, on this city that we're, that we're in? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, f to generalize, I, f I feel primarily like architect, I, my reading of architecture is as a symbolic language, I think primarily, but also a very specific kind of symbolic language that unlike the written word, for example, or spoken language, contains both an inside interior and an outside as well. And for me, what's interesting is that that exists on many different levels. There's, you know, most simply the, the act of being inside and outside of a building, mm -hmm. the, the act of being inside or outside a particular society. So, and, and also those like different acts, levels of access that creates, I mean, in most simple terms, that's just called public and private space. But I feel this notion of like, being inside or outside a building, a system, a culture, a language, a technology, yeah. are things that really kind of pervade this, you know, the idea of, of my work. So for example, in the more narrative films like Geomancer and Idol, it's about a narrative idea of being an outsider, yeah. or of like a conscious AI as an outsider within human society, or of a kind of like wandering eye being an outsider to buildings that they cannot gain access to. So really this idea of interiority and exteriority and also the constant um, transgressions between both, being inside and outside, is really at the core of like, the narrative approach I have. Yeah. But again, going back to Pernese, it's a really interesting example because of course his images didn't exist in isolation. They, they were published as, as books, right? Mm -hmm. As you know, a series of visions of ancient Rome or something that had, you know, and with the, the seriality of those images, you can't help but read a narrative into it, not just the individual image, which is like where your eye kind of like traces a journey through the space, but between these um, different landmarks or monuments that are both frozen in time, but you can't, again, you can't help but think about ruins. You can't help about thinking, looking at, you know, just the world outside your window in a different way. I mean, there, there is like a utopia to that project, right? It, it kind of creates its own world, and you can imagine almost like all of these, all of these, these visions that he has of, of existing within the same city, right? And I mean, I think that that's that's quite similar to to the way that you know at least bonus levels took place, right? How it was literally set out in like on within the map of England, right? Exactly. So, just one thing that I realized as well is that you know, Piranesi wasn't. Obviously, he was kind of creating these like fantastical spaces, but he was kind of sampling existing structures yeah. and kind of recombining them in new ways, which is you know completely you know simulated design, yeah. and not just that. In his like surface treatment of of these ruins, basically, it's not like the weeds weren't growing on the column already. What he did was just basically make the weeds overgrow the column so that they became the column itself. Yeah. Whereas I think for me working with digital design, you know, like I would just embrace the glossiness of what the medium wants to do. So instead of making textures look more worn, which is a big, a very common trope, especially in more, I guess, like, you know, steampunk or like realistic simulation, mm -hmm. I really enjoy the glossiness of the building mm -hmm. as a perfect thing, as, it's, as if it's just opened like 30 minutes ago before the weeds have had any time to grow. So it's kind of like this reverse ruin kind of thing where it is ever, ever new as opposed to um, simulated age. Yeah, but, but I think in, in both, I mean, I mean, Piranesi was kind of extracting a tendency of, of you know, some sort of like cultural understanding or some sort of approach towards architecture. So I don't, I mean, it's the, the, the results look very different, but I wonder if like, you know, the approach to software is not actually quite similar, right? How, how, you know, there's a certain, like, there's a certain acceptance, like, all right, if this is the way that, you know, we are producing images and, and images are creating our cultural imaginary, let's take that seriously, yeah. right? And I... No, no, totally. And, and of course, you know, he was kind of creating these images at a time when, you know, this, like, the idea of a, 
of a return to history of like the Roman ruin, which was also born out of like, you know, different tendencies towards imperialism and nation building and, you know, pride in the past basically, was proceeding along this kind of really where history, the idea of history was a novel thing. Whereas I feel nowadays, the difference is that the idea of speculation or, you know, future oriented thinking is, it's kind of exactly, it's like a mirror image really where, you know, we're looking kind of towards the future, both because the way things are promised to us in architecture and advertising, or even, you know, next year's um, new series of this net Netflix docu documentary or whatever, you know, it's always <clears throat> moving forward. Yeah. yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, it definitely kind of raises the question of then what of the present, right? I mean, how, or, you know, can the city ever be understood as a static being or is it always kind of this future looking entity that is always like kind of competing or th there are different imaginaries that are, that are kind of competing for what the, what the city will actually like uh, pick up? No, totally. So going back to, again, when I was studying architecture, it was like there was seemed this kind of schism, this divide between those who draw and those who build, or in, a way, in another way, kind of this elitist proposition of those who think and those who do, you know? And I think <clears throat> it's a really false binary, but when I notice the kind of, how should I say, the rise of like more cartographic practices, which you can see in um, Strauka in a way, forensic architecture in a kind of parallel way, where actually, instead of dealing with the, you know, paper brick divide it's actually they didn't they didn't go stay on the ground they actually kind of zoomed out into space and so of course the issue with cartography or video games is that it gives the creator let's say a kind of god's eye view right that that allows a different perspective and i don't know what the answer is but it, i just witnessed a very interesting tendency not to you know to basically zoom out you know, to yeah. zoom out into space or to zoom out into different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum to, to explore the new frontiers of architecture. Yeah. And often maybe because that was, for some people, where the, the true present lay, not within, yeah. you know, brick and paper, but within this kind of like intangible, you know, power networks and structures. And mm -hmm. I feel just when I kind of follow a certain kind of line of architectural discourse and kind of spatial practice now, it seems really pervasive, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this this act of kind of zooming out is almost done so that one can see more closely, right? And I mean, if we, if we think of like how our eyes and optics work, I mean, sometimes we are too close to things, right? And so we actually need to to, to push things away so that we can see things in more, in more resolution. No, totally. Um, and I also feel that there's also, but the, the kind of irony I feel with that is that in the very act of trying to critique let's say, power or territory or interiority, mm. the, you know, what's a more privileged viewpoint than the God's eye view? So for me, it's really interesting having both that zoomed out perspective, but also just the thick in the ground, you know, first person or first whatever yeah. kind of yeah, first person right? um, perspective that goes through the world and doesn't mm. just escape it in order to assume a different form of knowledge mm. or control. But so in the sense, is there almost like an ethical imperative to your work to make it a video game and not just a simulation, right? Not just like kind of a, because I mean, I, I was, I mean, in a lot of your films, there's like a scripted way of moving through this um, this world, but then in your video games, it's an open world, right? So, I mean, is, I mean, I, I wanted to ask, like, you know, what do you see that video games kind of do? But I think what you're, at least with regards to this understanding of like an expanded spatial practice, um, that it kind of forces you back into the ground and it, and it in, in, a, in a very kind of weird way, it kind of prevents you from taking the God's eye view that this thing came from in the first place. Right, I mean, you know, like, Haran Faroki or Hitosel like play a lot with this idea of you know the simulation of space or vertical perspective and so on. I think I, my interest is slightly kind of runs parallel with that, but in a slightly different way because I'm interested in also interested in you know the idea of like freedom, right? Not in this um, ethical, abstract, political sense, but f simply in terms of a privileged point of view. So for example, 
in some of my early bonus levels work, if you found a teleporter kind of Easter egg section, it would bring you to the top of the tower, you know? So that for like 10 seconds, you could look at the world from above, you know? And I feel that's a really, I think I've said this before in, in a way that that's a really utopian viewpoint, just to be able to look over the city. The, you know, that's the kind of sublime Eiffel Tower, seeing the city from above from the first time, which is also the ruler's point of view, right? Gazing down from the top of the pyramids, whatever, mm -hmm. looking down. But I feel this idea of access to a new point of view, even in a very literal sense, is what open world games kind of engage with explicitly, just in the very nature of mm -hmm. how they are rendered from a single point of view. And again, it's interesting thinking about God games like Populous or SimCity, where it's, it's, it's a map. Yeah. It's a map yeah. that you build, and mm -hmm. you're in control of zoning, and you see everything as equal because it's isometric or it's you know, um, from the top down. And in a really, um, I think in a really subliminal or really deep way, you, mm -hmm. it just engages a different part of your brain where like you're a kid playing with a sandbox and you're, look, you're looking over it. Mm. And there's a, that power that gives is, is just an interesting, uh, interesting habit that's, that's formed you know, a very long time ago for I think anyone who engages with spatial practice, even it's drawing lines in the sand. And I think my interest in virtual worlds is that it's not just a new kind of cinema or moving image or architectural practice, but it's a way to always think about this constant shift of inside and outside in aesthetics as well as politics, basically, or ethics in a way. Mm -hmm. um, that is also, because I am also slave to the technology, I'm slave to the computers I can afford, I'm slave to like whatever the latest updates and plugins are. I think that's, that makes it interesting for me because mm -hmm. it makes me really have to engage with commercial concerns or commercial technologies, which yeah. is not something, it's something I actually embrace quite a lot because I can't, um, I think it's, it's important to really understand these things. Yeah, and, and in a certain way, um, you know, each of your works kind of is a marker of historical moment of kind of like where, where this technology kind of is. So, I mean, you, you mentioned this word like outdated before, but that you can almost read that as intentional, right? To say like, this is what was possible at this time. And as long as you kind of keep going, then, then you can understand it within that trajectory. Right, exactly. I felt maybe about three years ago when I looked at stuff that was two years old, I was like, oh God, that looks terrible. But now I'm like, that's great because it really is a snapshot of so many of these things. Mm -hmm. So it, it forms like a document or an archive, not just of my practice, but also of what was available at the time. Yeah, but, uh, but that, that kind of, that instant aging of work, I mean, that's also something that I experience like with writing, um, right? Where I look back and I'm like, whoa, okay, this, this was just written two years ago, but I, I can barely identify with it, right? So I think that this isn't something that just happens with um, you know, with kind of advanced technology, it's yeah. something that happens with, with cultural production more widely and maybe like a, a more sincere recognition of that. Um, no, totally, important. totally. Like, because in the works of mine that do have a script in it, whether it's a kind of video essay or kind of fictional film, I do notice that sometimes I was just trying too hard to make a point, Some, and maybe from a, for a useful kind of like polemic reason, um, like in Sinofuturism or something, and other, but once I became self, like, self-conscious about that, I went, I deliberately tried to make, not balance the argument, but kind of highlight the ambiguity in any kind of singular position, which for me, like, dovetails into the, what I was saying about perspective, you know, a point of view. Yeah, and I, so I, I, I have a feeling that we might need to wrap up yeah, but I, I, as maybe kind of like a concluding question, and I think speaks to a lot of these, um, these kind of differing perspectives of on the ground or in the sky, um, a, a recurring motif in your work are drones, right? Mm -hmm. These kind of little things that are flying around. So, but beyond like a, maybe a speculation to say that like, oh, well, we will have to learn to live with drones within, you know, a number of years. Um, I also see this as maybe as, as being this kind of in between as something that can't necessarily be constrained, you know, it's not constrained to gravity, um, but yet it doesn't have entirely the same power as, as, as God. So I wonder if you can speak to kind of what role, what narrative role those, those play within, within your practice. Sure. I mean, partly it's, 
I mean, sometimes it's a functional device to make it ambiguous whose point of view you're looking through. But I think, actually, the most interesting thing about drones is that the drone is, let me think, the drone is like the worker bee that cannot reproduce, right? So actually, it's, it's the worker that is purely a worker, essentially. So it's slightly different from a robot, you know, because I think just like semantically, you, do, you associate the drone as this device of pure automation that is with no agency of itself. And so, again, going back to this idea of freedom or like, you know, the video game where, where you think you're free, you think it's an open world, but it's just called an open world. Um, so it's effectively open, but of course, there's definitely walls, both kind of like algorithmically, programmatically, and computational, like barriers around that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, my interest in the drone is as this symbol, this idea that it can access anywhere, it can fly up, down, left, right, it can hover in position for, you know, indefinitely, mm -hmm. um, at least in the game. And, <clears throat> you know, to what, I, I don't know, to generalize, to what extent we feel we have agency or freedom, but the drone that we are situated within, we are the drone within a system with higher degrees of freedom rather than just up, down, left, or right. But yeah. we're always trying to, like, push against them or, like, pass through from an interior to another exterior mm -hmm. and then, again, forced to confront the limitations of our own perspective, whether it's our narrative, the writing, our aesthetic, or just our you know, different constraints. So yeah. it's, um, I wouldn't say the drone is kind of like my, you know, alter ego in that, but it's just a, it's just a useful device to have that doesn't yeah. evoke the questions of like robotic or biological or human avatar ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, there, there is kind of this moment in no tell, right, where you can slip out of the world, right? So there, there are these kind of gaps that you can kind of fall through. I mean, you know, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the bonus levels that you were mentioning where you can go to the top of the tower, that's maybe more, like, explicit. But I like how, I mean, maybe as the drone kind of embodies, there are ways to kind of evade this, this way, you know, the, the forward, back, left, right up, down, left, right, or there are ways to, to explore the world in a different way. Um, yeah. So, you yeah, know, yeah. like running through the, you know, the endless, uh, the endless city of Notel was like, was, was a really kind of amazing experience because that's actually where I feel like I got to see like, oh, so this is actually what this environment is and this is how it was created as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so sometimes those like, again, mistakes are unintentional, but really good in that they reveal the fact that there is an outside, essentially. And also, in many video games, m buildings are modeled purely as facade. And it's a completely different model once you pass through the doorway. So again, the, the doorway is another kind of computationally liminal space where the, inter the, dis the detailed interior with chairs, monitors, you know, glasses and water reflections aren't loaded until you get inside. Um, but it's always interesting, again, th thinking about how architecture exists in a simulation because of the computational limitations as opposed to the physical ones. Because again, there's this, there's this kind of slightly misunderstood cliche that you, know, you can do anything in the virtual, and it's like absolutely not true. It's yeah. just the limitations are very different. Yeah, it's like a different, uh, it's a different tectonic system. Almost. Exactly, exactly. And things have to fit together in a very different but highly specific way as well. 